Hello and welcome everyone to Oceanside Library's President's Week program. In honor of President's Week and his birthday last Friday, I now would love to introduce our guest for today, President Abraham Lincoln. Well, thank you, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be able to join you through this new technology. Well, here I am in Washington, DC, and you're up there in New York, uh, Oceanside. I hear, by the way, you got a shopping center up there named for me. That's nice. A great Lincoln shopping center right near the library there. I'll have to visit sometime. Well, I understand that after all these years, because uh, I can tell some time has passed since we're using this new technology, that our great nation still exists today. And that's wonderful. You see, back in my day, we we're having a little bit of trouble on that very subject of being united. The United States, we were just the opposite. You see, we were divided into two like this, or more like that we were. In fact, I had a speech on that subject. I should like to read it to you, but before we do that, I don't suppose we need to stand outside here. It might start snowing any moment now. So how about we go up inside there? Oh, that is a nice statue there, isn't it? And you even gave me a chair to sit in. That's nice of you. Well, I gave this speech once. I just need to find it now. Oh, just remembered where I always kept my speeches, right there in the hat. Here's the one I'm looking for. I was asked to give a few appropriate remarks on one very special occasion. And this is what I said. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Well, there's a bit more to this speech, but we'll save that for later. Now, I dare say I just said the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but I believe some of you recognize some of those words there. Why, well, they're, they're engraved right here in the wall too, aren't they? That's my speech right there. You probably know then I gave this speech at, well, Gettysburg, there in Pennsylvania, great battle had taken place there, you see. We come there to dedicate a cemetery for the soldiers. Now, four score and seven years ago, that's just a fancy way to say 87 years ago. And 87 years before I gave this speech was the year 1776. And 1776, I'm sure you remember, was the year that Thomas Jefferson wrote that Declaration of Independence, where the people who founded our country said we should like to be an independent country, separate from England have our own laws, have our own leaders. And in that declaration, they said this, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty and equality, right there in our Declaration of Independence, which is why I spoke about those same two things here. Of course, in 1776, that liberty and that equality were imperfectly realized. For as we all know, we also had in this nation of ours the institution of human slavery. As it was then after the Revolutionary War, for it's one thing to declare your independence, a whole other thing to be independent. We had to fight a war for that, didn't we? But we won that great Revolutionary War with General Washington. And then afterwards, they said we should like to make a more perfect union, a new kind of government, a constitution. And as part of that process, they had a big argument about slavery and its place in this new nation of ours. In the end, they had to make some compromises. 
a whole series of compromises. I'm sure your politicians today still understand this idea of compromise. Well, in any event, uh, states in the North said to the states in the South, very well, you may have your slaves. We shall even allow you to retrieve your runaway slaves. Some people in the North didn't like that, but that was part of the agreement, you see. In exchange, the South agreed that in 21 more years, Congress could pass a new law, say no more new slaves could be brought here from Africa. The hope in the North was this, if we could somehow just contain slavery in the South, not let it spread much, cut off the slave trade, eventually slavery might just fade away. Well, that was a hope at least. Well, so our country was born and we began to grow. You know how it was there in the beginning, of course, there were 13 states, including New York, one of the original 13, right? Seven free states in the North, six slave states in the South. And what happened next is more people began arriving from England, began, other people began moving across the country. We began adding new states to our country. And every so many years, as we added new states and as our country grew, we get to an argument again about slavery, whether it should be allowed in a new place or not. What about in the territories out West? And so it was, we came to the year 1820. Now by 1820, we had grown all the way from the Atlantic Ocean, all the way to the Mississippi River. And we were ready for the first new state located entirely west of the Mississippi River. Just one little problem. This new state was located exactly in the middle between the North and the South, state of Missouri. And people in the South said this new state of Missouri ought to be a slave state. We wanna take our slaves there. People in the North said, no, no, it should be a free state, no slavery. Got to arguing about it, arguing something fierce. Why? They were talking about splitting the nation up over the issue of slavery way back in 1820. We weren't even 50 years old yet. Sounds like we need another compromise. That's what they called it, the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Senator Henry Clay from Kentucky, he said, how about we let Missouri here be a slave state? But to compensate, we'll make a new state out of New England called Maine, keep the balance that way. 12 free states, 12 slave states. And we'll do something else, and this was very important. He said, how about we just draw a line from the southern border of Missouri, keep right on going west, through all that land we bought from France, the Louisiana Purchase. And in the future, north of that line, no slavery allowed. Now, you remember that. That was very important. We're going to come back to that in 34 years, which will be in about two minutes. <laughs> and now we got all that little problem. We can get in the business of growing our nation again. The 1820s come and the 30s and the 40s and millions of new immigrants, more and more coming every year, coming from new places now too, coming from Ireland, Germany, later the Scandinavian countries, Norway and Sweden, moving westward, adding new states all the time. By the end of the 1840s, we had grown to be 30 states, 15 free states in the North, 15 slave states in the South. And about that same time, something was discovered out in the ground in California. Where's California? There, California. Gold had the gold rush. Tens of thousands of people moved all the way across the continent, all the way to California. By 1850, California had enough people to be a state. But what kind of state? Had the same argument all over again, free or slave. In the end, we had to have another compromise, compromise of 1850, Henry Clay again. That's why we called him the great compromiser. Henry Clay was my idol as a politician, founder of the Whig party, the American system, all that. Well, that pretty much how things were in this country of ours. During the first half of the 19th century, as I grew up and was a young man and a bit older man, every so many years, as this great nation of ours grew in size and numbers, we'd have an argument about slavery and its place in this nation. We'd have to come up with some sort of compromise, get along for a while. But then in the 1850s, it all kind of fell apart. Beginning in the year 1854, when Senator Stephen Douglas of my adopted home state of Illinois started all the trouble, he got up in Congress and he said, Remember back in 1820 when they drew that line? 
He said, north of that line, no slavery. He said, that's really not working anymore. How about we get rid of that? How about we say instead each new state, when it comes in, the people can vote. They can choose to be a free state or a slave state. Nah, uh, pretty simple, isn't it? Let the people decide. Sounds a bit like democracy, doesn't it? Isn't that what we're all about as a nation, democracy? Don't suppose they were going to let the slaves vote on that, though, were they? Maybe not so democratic after all. And this is what it really meant. It meant that instead of having slavery contained in the South with the hope that one day we might be rid of it entirely, slavery now be allowed to spread into new parts, into the North, into the West, we might never be rid of slavery now. And this is what got a lot of people in the North rather excited, myself included. I had been retired from politics some five years at that point. I got right back in, started giving speeches. I said, no, what we ought to do instead is go back to that Declaration of Independence, readopt it for ourselves today. But now let's have laws and policies which are in harmony with the great ideas in that document. And this will begin a whole series of events which will take us pretty quickly through the rest of the 1850s up to 1860 and my election as president. But before I talk about all that, I think I better take a little step back here, tell you about my own rather humble beginnings. How was it I got involved in this great struggle anyway? Now, I was not alive in 1776. I'm not that old, you know. No, I wasn't born until the year 1809, which means my grandparents were alive in 1776. And, well, my grandmother, Bathsheba, she used to tell me stories of those days, told me all about my grandfather. Abraham Lincoln was his name. I was named for him. She said he was a captain in the Revolutionary War. And after the war, he did what a lot of young men did. He headed west. He left Virginia, headed west about the same time a fellow named Daniel Boone headed west. They knew each other, the Boones and the Lincolns did. In fact, they ended up in the same place together, the state of Kentucky. Well, what would become the state of Kentucky, you understand? And that's where I would be born. Uh, Kentucky was the frontier, you understand? Edge of civilization. Not a whole lot of people. A lot of animals, wild animals, a lot of trees. Oh, one kind of person we still had a lot of were Indians. The reason I never met my grandfather, he was shot and killed by an Indian long before I was born. That's a very different sort of place to grow up, isn't it? But that's where I grew up in Kentucky, my first seven years. Now, back then, of course, we didn't have nearly as many states. This is what we had. Well, this was our flag, excuse me, 15 stars. There actually were already 17 states, but we're still using the flag with the 15 stars. And the number of stripes, you don't even need to count those, do you? Or maybe you should. <laughs> this flag has 15 stars and 15 stripes. That's what we did back then. For each new state, we added a new star and a new stripe. And then we began thinking, why well, soon we'll be 20 states, maybe someday 25 or 30. Think how small those stripes will get then. So we said, how about on our next flag, we put just 13 stripes for the original 13 colonies, which is why your flag looks like it does today. This flag has a special name, by the way. I suppose you've heard of it. It's called the Star Spangled Banner. And it was flagged when I was born back in 1809. Well, I spent my first seven, nearly eight years in Kentucky. And then my pa found out that they were making a brand new state north of the Ohio River from where we lived in Kentucky. And this new state was part of the Northwest Territory. It means no slavery allowed there. My pa and ma didn't much like slavery, you see. Also, land titles would be a bit more secure in this new state. Back in Kentucky, my pa lost a couple of farms over disputes about land, you see. So when I was seven, nearly eight, we moved across the Ohio River into the state of Indiana, just when Indiana became a state. And I would live there in Indiana from the time I was seven till I was 21, all grown up. Those are important, important years in a person's life, aren't they? The years you become the person you'll be the rest of your life in terms of your character, your ambition, things like that. And those were good years. Not that everything that happened was good, of course, when I was nine years old, something very sad happened. My ma died, my dear angel mother. 
About a year later, my pa went back to Kentucky. He knew a woman down there whose husband had died. And the two of them got married. And just as I had a wonderful mother, I was blessed with a wonderful stepmother. And she had three children of her own. So imagine this now, all living in one little cabin. <laughs> you got my pa and my stepma and my sister Sarah and me. Uh, we were Abraham and Sarah, you see. And then our three stepbrothers and sisters, uh, John and Matilda and uh, Elizabeth. And then we had my cousin. My cousin Dennis lived with us too. Eight people, all in one little cabin. Got a little cozy sometimes. But we learned how to live together, how to work together. Now, do you suppose growing up there on the frontier in Kentucky and Indiana, I could go to school much? Hardly had school back then on the frontier. No, in the fall, that's harvest time. Everyone has to help on the farm at harvest time. And in the spring, that's planting time. No time for school in the spring. We'd have school in the middle of winter for about two months. Two months of school, all we ever had. And not every year either, only when there happened to be a teacher around. More often than not, there wasn't a teacher. I only went to five different schools for about two months each. You could figure that out even if you never went to school. Ten months, less than one year of formal schooling my entire life. But I had a great passion for learning. So once I knew how to read, that's the key, isn't it? When you know how to read, you can get yourself books. Now, we didn't have many books back then on the frontier either. We didn't have a nice fancy library like you have there. No, but at, when I was at home, when I was born, we only had one book, the Bible, of course. Later, my stepma had more books. She had Aesop's Fables, The Pilgrim's Progress, Robinson Crusoe, William Scott's Lessons in Elocution with selections from Shakespeare and Byron, all the great poets. And, and I'd read these few books over and over again. And then I'd go to a neighbor's house to see if I could borrow books. I would walk miles to borrow a book. I said, my best friend is a man who will lend me a book I haven't read before. Do you know, even when I was president, I go to the Library of Congress, they call it, and I could check out books. Books about military science, books about the American West, about the Mormons in Utah, things I needed to know about as president. You're never too old to learn now, are you? Well, my pa thought so. I got to be about 14 years old. My pa said, enough learning, son. Time for you to work. I was already working at home, mind you, but he started to hire me out the neighbors to work. I remember when I was 16, I worked the whole summer long down by the Ohio River. Hard work it was, six days a week, 12 hours a day. Oh, I got paid, you understand? Each month, $6. $6 a month seemed like a lot of money back then. Do you suppose I got to keep that money? All the money I earned, I had to give to my pa till I was 21. Didn't quite seem right, but that's the way it was. Speaking of things, it didn't quite seem right. When I was 19, I took a little boat trip down the old high river, down the Mississippi River. And the further south we went, the more slaves we saw. And the harsher the conditions seemed to get for those slaves. And we got all the way to New Orleans. And at first I was mighty impressed, such a big city, different languages being spoken. And then I saw something there I never wanted to see again. Human beings being led up the street in chains up to the auction block, a slave auction, human beings for sale. Men, women, and children. And there's nothing I could do about it. According to the laws of our nation, this was all right to do. Got back up to Indiana, got to be 21. That means I can leave home now. Just then, my pa announced, well, son, we're moving again, heading west out to the prairie. You want to come along? No. I went along. And that's how I moved to the state of Illinois, where I would spend the next well, the rest of my life until I was elected president. I stayed with the family for one year, helped them get settled. With. And then I did what a young man does. I headed west, but I didn't leave Illinois. Settled in a little village called New Salem. I hear you can still go to New Salem today and see what it looked like when I lived there. You can see the post office where I worked as postmaster. 
That was a wonderful job for me. The newspapers got delivered to the post office. I could read the papers, see what's going on in this great country of ours. I worked as a store clerk for a while in a general store. I even served three months in the Black Hawk War, elected captain of my volunteer company. I worked as a surveyor for a while. And then a friend of mine, and we went in together on business. I thought I could be a businessman. We bought ourselves a little general store. This is the Barry Lincoln store. Turns out that we weren't very good businessmen. We lost money, had to close down our little store. And then my friend passed away and I took on all his debt. I didn't have to do that, but I did. I, I, I owed over a thousand dollars at that point in time. No way to pay it back. But I said, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to pay this money back if it takes me 10 years or more, which it did. But because of that, people gave me a nickname. That's right. Honest Abe, they said. He's an honest feller, going to pay back his debts. Good to be honest, right? Now, when we still had this store, uh, before it shut down, a fellow came along once and sold us a barrel. Uh, but he said, I believe there's some old books in the bottom of it, not worth anything. Books, not worth anything. I couldn't wait till he left. I dove right in. I found a complete set of William Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England, law books. And I started reading these law books. And I was fascinated. I devoured those books. Then I had a friend named John Todd Stewart. That name Todd sound familiar to you? He's got a niece. She'll come in later. John Todd Stewart was a lawyer in Springfield. And he lent me his law books. And I started studying those. And after a couple more years, I knew enough. I took the examination. And I passed it. They said, congratulations, you're an attorney at law now. By this time, I'm also a state representative elected to the Illinois General Assembly, you see. I was actually that before I was a lawyer. Well, now that I'm a representative and also a, a lawyer, well, John Todd Stewart invited me actually to become his junior partner. So it was time to leave behind little New Salem and her 200 people. Time to move to the big city, Springfield. Why, Springfield had nearly 2,000 people living it. Biggest place I'd ever lived. A lot of new people to meet. I love meeting new people. Well, all except one kind of person. The young ladies, the unmarried young ladies. I was terrified of them. Never knew what to say to them, how to act around them, all of the nice, pretty, clean dresses. Me and my old dirty clothes, it didn't quite fit right. But I met a young lady there in Springfield. Well, John Todd Stewart introduced me to his niece. Miss Mary Todd from Lexington, Kentucky, from a very fine family, the Todd family. Well, I learned pretty quickly that this Miss Todd was very intelligent. Pretty, of course. She even liked talking about politics. That was very unusual for a lady back then. And she was very particular about her politics. Do you know the great Stephen Douglas wanted to court Mary Todd? She had nothing to do with him. He's a Democrat. She was a Whig. Her father was a Whig politician back in Lexington. She knew the great Henry Clay herself. Well, that gave me a little advantage, didn't it? One day I was at a dance and finally got up enough nerve to ask her. I said, Miss Todd, I should like to dance with you the worst way. I really wanted to dance with her, you see. Well, she accepted and we danced. And I found out later, she told her friends I had done exactly as I said, danced in the worst way, not very well. Well, that's all right. Miss Todd and I got along okay, started courting, eventually started, well, we eventually got married, 1842. Now, uh, meanwhile, my, my law business is growing. You see, now I'm no longer with John Todd Stewart. I figured I'm married to a Todd, don't need to work for one. Eventually I had my own law practice with my friend, Billy Herndon. Lincoln Herndon Law Office, right here in Springfield on the corner by the, by the Capitol. You see, that's the other thing. We moved the Capitol to Springfield. I had something to do with that in the General Assembly, you see. So things are going pretty well. Uh, I'm married to Miss Todd, and, and, and well, my law business is growing. The state of Illinois is growing. Springfield's growing. In fact, the whole country is growing. Well, speaking of growing, uh, our little cottage we bought, Mary and I, we finally had a, enough money to pay it off our debts, you see. And, we began adding on to it until eventually it looked like this. The only home we own in Springfield, Illinois. 
And we needed a house like this because the family's growing too, you see. Our oldest child, that was Robert. Robert Todd Lincoln, named for Mary's father. And he was more Todd than, than a Lincoln, he was. Bobby, we called him. Our second son, that was Edward, Eddie. Poor Eddie. He died there in Springfield, not quite four years old. Tuberculosis, I believe you call it today. Our third son, well, that was William or Willie. Willie was a bright boy. Came with us to Washington when I was president. Died there in Washington, 10 years old, 11, excuse me, 11 years old, typhoid fever. Our last boy, that was Thomas, named for my pa. Four boys, imagine that. Uh, Thomas, but we didn't call him Thomas. Thomas had a big head like babies sometimes do. And he was very wiggly. I looked at him when he was born. I said, why? He looks like a tadpole. That's what we called him, tadpole. Well, then we shortened it later to tad. Well, I think that's enough about my personal story. We better get back to the story of the nation. We left off in 1854, a very important year. That's the year that Stephen Douglas said this bit about, we'll just let slavery spread wherever it might go. Do you realize that Stephen Douglas claimed to have no opinion on slavery, whether it was a good thing or not such a good thing? Those of us who did have an opinion on it and wanted to keep it from spreading into new parts of the country, we formed a new political party at this time to fight the extension of slavery into the West. The Republican Party, we called it. 1856, we had our first presidential candidate, John Fremont, but he lost to James Buchanan, the Democrat. Very next year, two days after Buchanan took the oath of office, the Supreme Court issued its decision in Dred Scott versus Santa. And they ruled that a slave even a freed slave or his descendant could never be a citizen of this country. And then they went a little further. They said, by the way, back in 1820, when Congress drew that line, said north of that line, no slavery. Supreme Court said that was actually unconstitutional. Congress can't make laws like that. This commits people in the north. There's some kind of conspiracy in our government. They're all working together, trying to make slavery national trying to say there should be slavery in the North as well as the South. That's the direction this country was heading in 1857, which is why the next year when Stephen Douglas was up for re-election, it was such an important election, not just for Illinois, but for the whole nation. I was chosen to face him. I gave a speech back there in Springfield at that Capitol building. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. It will become all one thing or all the other. Mr. Douglas and I subsequently held that great series of debates widely followed throughout the whole nation. We debated all the great questions, whether Congress could pass laws restricting slavery. We even debated what did the founding fathers mean when they wrote all men are created equal? Who were they thinking of? I wish I could tell you I won that election. That was my great ambition in life, to be senator from Illinois. It was the second time I had tried. It would be the second time I would fail. But sometimes when you fail, you've just got to pick yourself up and try again, don't you? And a couple of years later, I found myself in another election with that same Mr. Douglas. Before I tell you about that, I should mention I made a little trip out your way right before that. 1860, February, this very month of February. I visited New York City and I gave a speech, a very important speech at the Cooper Union right down there in Manhattan. I had my picture taken when I was out in New York too. I'm gonna to show you the picture pretty soon here. It was a very important trip. I said that that speech and that photograph were what made me president, you see. It was just a few months after that, we had the, the convention in Chicago. And then at the end of that year, of course, was the election, the presidential election. The Republican party nominated me. Democratic Party nominated Douglas, but then the Southern Democrats split off, nominated their own candidate, John Breckinridge of Kentucky. There was even a fourth party, John Bell of the Constitutional Union Party. Four candidates for president. Talk about a divided nation. Now, I was very clear when I was running. I said, if you elect me to be your president, I shall do nothing to interfere with slavery in the Southern states where it already exists. I said that, of course, because I can't do anything about slavery there. 
The Constitution protects slavery. However, I said, I will fight, and I have to obey the Constitution, right, just like everyone else. However, I said, I will fight against slavery spreading into the West, into the North, like a cancer. That I shall do. And because I said that, after I was elected president, seven states in the South decided they didn't want me to be their president, decided the best solution was just to secede from the Union, leave the United States, form their own new country they called the Confederate States of America. That was a situation when I left Springfield to go to Washington in order to become president. Seven states already seceded. Now, back then, of course, we traveled by train. That's the fast way to go. But we took a long zigzag route through the north, stopped at lots of places along the way. Now, when you think of Abraham Lincoln today, I suppose you always think of a, a tall man with a tall hat and a beard. You know, most of my life, I, I didn't have the beard. Well, I, when I was running for president, even, I didn't have a beard. And then there was a little girl out in New York. Well, not so little, 11 years old she was. In fact, Grace Bedell was her name. And she had seen this photograph that Matthew Brady took of me there in New York. It was on a poster for the fair at New York, you see. And she wrote me a letter. She said, dear Mr. Lincoln, you have a very thin face. You'd be more handsome, I believe, if you grow some whiskers. She said, all the gentlemen are doing that now, growing whiskers on their faces. And she said, if you do that, well, the ladies will tease their husbands to vote for you, and you'll be elected president. May seem silly, but because of that letter, I started letting my whiskers grow, you see. And when we took that train ride to go to Washington, we stopped in Westfield, New York, and I got to meet Grace Bedell, the 11-year-old girl who wrote me that letter. I gave her a little kiss, showed her my whiskers. We went on our way, made another important stop a few days later. But now, by this time, I should tell you something else that happened very important in this country. We had a new state added to our union after my election, but before my inauguration. Kansas, after years of struggle over what kind of state Kansas should be, free or slave. We had a little mini civil war in Kansas over that issue. Well, she was finally admitted as a free state. We're 34 states now. Remember I told you when I was born, there were 17 states? Why we have exactly doubled in size in just 51 years. My, how we've grown. Now we normally waited till July the 4th to bring out the new flag. At this time be 34 stars, right? But that year, because of the trouble in the nation, we decided to bring it out early. Brought it out on February 22nd, George Washington's birthday, there in Philadelphia, standing in front of Independence Hall, where it all began. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. And we raised this new flag for the first time. Kind of my way to say that I, Abraham Lincoln, have been elected president of the 34 United States of America. Even though seven of the states represented by these stars, a whole row of them, has told me they're not part of the country anymore. I said, no, I shall do all in my power to preserve this union, keep us together as one nation. Well, got down to Washington, D.C. here, and came time for me to give my speech. Now, as you may know, the president gives his speech in front of the Capitol building, doesn't he? And this is what the Capitol building looked like on that day. You see, it was undergoing renovations and expansion, and they hadn't finished putting the brand new dome on it yet. An unfinished capital and what seemed to be an unfinished country, too. But I laid out all the reasons why I didn't think secession was the answer. I don't think it's legal. I don't think it's even practical. In the end, I appealed to the people to be reasonable, to be calm. I said, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. Six weeks later, we tried to send supplies down to Fort Sumter in South Carolina. Confederates fired on the fort. And just like that, we were enemies. The Civil War began. By summertime, there's fighting up in Northern Virginia, not far from Washington. And after Fort Sumter, four more slave states, Join the Confederacy. Now there's 11, including Virginia, greatest loss of all. Virginia, such a powerful state, a popular state, home of Robert E. Lee to boot. I should like for you to imagine for a moment. Imagine that you had been president back then. Here's the situation. 
you are theoretically the president of 34 United States. However, of the 15 slave states, 11 have seceded, formed what they call a new country called the Confederate States of America. And in addition, a war has begun, actual fighting between South and North. If you had been president back then, what are some of the things that you would have had to have done? What are some of the decisions you would have had to have made? Well, you're going to need some soldiers, don't you think? <laughs> Better get some soldiers here to guard the Capitol, among other things. Now, my advisors, they didn't think I knew what I was doing. They said, Mr. Lincoln, this is what you do. You ask for 75,000 volunteer soldiers for three months. We'll put this little rebellion down for you. Don't always believe what the experts tell you, especially when it comes to war. We might need just a few more men and a few more months, but we need soldiers, don't we? All right, we need soldiers and a soldier gonna need some things, gonna need some weapons, right? Rifles and muskets and cannon and ammunition and gunpowder, of course. Probably want some uniforms too, don't you think? Uniforms and boots and blankets and tents, things like that. Now, be careful on this. You know what's going to happen. You're going to have contractors try to sell you cheap stuff, charge you full price. Seems like everyone's trying to make a buck on this war. Be careful. All right, well, what else? Horses. Need a lot of horses, don't we, for the cavalry, for transportation. How about a Navy? Want to put a blockade on the South? We had to build a Navy almost from scratch. Oh, people get hurt in a war, don't they? Doctors, nurses, field hospitals, bandages, medicines. We're needing a lot of stuff here. How are you going to pay for all this? Do you think Congress left you a budget for the Civil War? <laughs> One Civil War, $10 million. Congress isn't even in session. They're not due back until December. <laughs> not such a bad thing. Means we can get started on some stuff and ask for permission later. You might call Congress back in session early, a special session. I suggest July the 4th be a good day. In the meantime, though, we needed some money. You know what we did? We went up to where you're at, up to New York City. That's where the money is. Went to the banks. So we'd like to borrow some money, pay for a little work. And the banker said, oh, very well, sir. Take this money, pay it back when you can, no hurry. 36% interest. <laughs> Told you everyone's trying to make a buck on this war. <laughs> well, we had a new idea then. We came back to Washington. We said, how about we just print some money? That's the solution, isn't it? Print money. Federal government didn't print money back then. The state banks did. The private banks. We said, we're going to make a brand new federal bank note. But to distinguish it from the state notes, we'll use a different color ink on the back. Green. Call them greenbacks. Maybe you still have green money today because of that decision. Oh, something else you might still have? Oh, no, you wouldn't have this. Another idea we had for raising money, we called it the income tax, just temporary. All right, well, we need money, don't we? But we need to make some decisions too. We, we said there were 15 slave states and 11 have, have formed the Confederacy. But what's that mean? Four slave states haven't left the Confederacy yet, or left the Union to join the Confederacy yet. The, the border states, we call them. Do you think you need to be concerned about these states? Awful lot of people in these border states who are sympathetic to the South. Uh, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware. We need to keep those states in the Union. Imagine this. Right now you're sitting in your office there in the executive mansion, and you you look out across the river there, you see the Confederate flag right over there in Virginia. What happens if Maryland joins the Confederacy? What happens to Washington? You'd be totally surrounded. You'd have to abandon Washington, D.C., move the capital up north, back to Philadelphia, back to New York, perhaps, and, and hopefully you get out in time. Uh, we need to do some things that we have to keep those states in the Union. You may have to do some things that are rather unpopular. Even unconstitutional in normal times to keep those states in the union. You might decide, for example, to take some of Maryland's legislators, put them in jail for a little while so they can't meet. Clearly unconstitutional in normal times, but these aren't normal times, are they? You have a rebellion on your hands. 
an armed insurrection against the national authority. And you better do something about it. Well, one more question for you. Who's going to lead your army? Well, oh, that's easy, isn't it? You're the commander in chief. You can get on the horse yourself and lead the men off into battle. Maybe not such a good idea, especially if you look like me. Pretty easy target. All right, who do we need to lead our army? Well, we need some generals, don't we? That ought to be easy. Find a few good capable leaders in our army, men to lead our army, men who will listen to you as a civilian authority over them. Might have just a little bit of trouble there. You've heard of George McClellan, I suppose, well, from New Jersey, not far from you. Mr. Lincoln, I need more men. I need more supplies for my men. I need more time to prepare my men. The enemy, look at the enemy. He's got twice as many as I do. Always coming up with excuses for why he couldn't engage the Confederates in battle. He was. Wasn't just McClellan either. All right. Well, speaking of generals and speaking of border states, we made John Fremont a Union general. Send him out to Missouri. I didn't think this one through very well. John Fremont was an abolitionist. The abolitionists were the ones who said we ought to just say the slaves are free. Be done with it. Don't worry about what the Constitution says. John Fremont got out to Missouri, I suppose he couldn't help himself. He says, I declare the slaves of all rebels in Missouri are free. Now I ask you, as president, are you going to do something about that? I'll tell you what, if you don't, Missouri is voting to join the Confederacy tomorrow. I'll probably take with her the other three border states. And half your soldiers are going to turn around and walk on home. They're not going to fight to free the slaves. Not at the beginning of the war. No, I'm sorry. I, I had to overrule him on that. I also decided I better put him somewhere else more suited to his political convictions. I was having trouble finding a spot for him. I said, it reminds me of the man who had a son getting up in years. And the father says to the son, now, son, it's about time for you to take a wife. Very well, father. Whose wife shall I take? That was my dilemma with Fremont. See, if I give him another command, means taking it away from some other worthy general. Well, our little three month war turned into six months and then into a year, into a second year. And I began thinking more about the slaves. I said, I think now, now is the time. Now it is perfectly clear to everyone that the fact that there are slaves in the South is helping the South in their rebellion. So that does give me authority, not as president per se, but as commander in chief of the army and Navy. And I came up with a little proclamation. I was all, right, all ready to issue it in the summer of 62, July 62. And I shared it with my cabinet. And Secretary Seward said, uh, if you do it now when the war is going badly in the East, gonna look like the last desperate shriek of an administration about to go under. He said, you ought to wait for a victory. I said, I, I need to wait for George McClellan? <laughs> well, we waited. We waited through the rest of July. Waited through all of August, waited through half of September. And then General Lee did us a favor. General Lee invaded the North. Result was a terribly bloody battle of Antietam or Sharpsburg in Maryland, single bloodiest day of the entire Civil War. But at the end of that day, General Lee turned around and headed back south. It was a victory I had been awaiting. Five days later, I issued my draft Emancipation Proclamation. Draft because I wanted to give the South just one more chance to come back into the Union and the war. I said, uh, if you come back before January 1st, before in the next 100 days, you can keep your slaves. That's what the Constitution still says, after all. If you don't, I would declare on that date that your slaves are then, thenceforward, and forever free. Well, January 1st came around, and this took effect. Practically speaking, it didn't free too many slaves that first day. Remember, it only applied to areas in rebellion. But it meant two things. It meant as our army was able to gain territory, the slaves were liberated. Some of those same slaves later joined the army themselves for their own freedom. And it also meant that this war is no, long, no longer just about preserving the Union. It is now also about giving freedom to the slave. I judge that the Northern people go along with me on this now, enough of them at least. Oh, I still got complaints, you understand? I have soldiers say, oh, I ain't fighting to free no slaves. Well, well son, how about you fight to preserve the Union then and we'll let the other fellows fight to free the slaves? Enough fighting to go on for everybody here, I think. Note that the proclamation did not apply to the border states. 
We were working at the same time, however, to get the border states to voluntarily abolish slavery. Well, a few months after that proclamation, well, eight months later, I suppose, I had a special visitor at the White House. Well, came from your state of New York, more upstate he was from, uh, Rochester, came to see me at the White House. I think you've heard of him. Frederick Douglass was his name. Now, he had criticized me in the past over my slowness to do some things, you see. So I welcomed the opportunity for us to sit down and talk over some of these things. We came to a much better, much better understanding of things. I explained to him how I couldn't always do what I what I'd like to do, free all the slaves immediately, because I was constrained by by on the one hand our laws, the Constitution; on the other hand, by public opinion. But I'm moving as fast as I can. I said, and I thought about this remarkable man. I thought I had overcome a lot in my life, but I considered all that he had overcome so much more than I had ever faced. I couldn't but wonder about him. He was clearly my equal or even my superior in so many ways, in intelligence, courage, moral character, speaking ability. He seemed to me to be my equal in every way except the color of our skin. Well, I suppose I tell you, before I tell you how the war ended, I want to tell you quickly uh, how it was like for my boys to live in the White House. You think it'd be fun to live in the White House? Don't know if we have any, uh, if Rebecca's still on or any other kids around today, but uh, for a kid, uh, living in the White House would be kind of fun, don't you think? Well, uh, let me tell you what it looked like back then. This is what it looked like. There's the White House. No wings. What would you put in those wings anyway? No, on this side over here is where we had the, 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 the stables. That's where we had the courthouse. Excuse me. We had the horses and the carriages over here. On this side, this is where we had the greenhouse. And that's where we kept the, the decorative plants and flowers in there. Mrs. Lincoln liked to go in there a lot. So this is what the White House looked like. And we moved in and well, Robert wasn't with us. Now that's something. I only had a year of school my whole life, but my boy Robert went to proper school. And by this time he was at Harvard College. Imagine that, what a country this is. But Willie, he was 10 years old. And Tad, he was almost eight. And they came into the White House and they were so excited. They did what boys do. They went exploring. And they found themselves in this real fancy room in the White House. Gentlemen, we need to remember to take our hats off inside the house. And she said, Oh, it's all decorated in red. See that? We called it the crimson room. And they use it for, uh, well, our boys were told, <laughs> no playing in here. This is for official government use only. Well, there was one kind of playing they could do. This is where Mrs. Pia Miss, Mrs. Lincoln had the piano put. And our boys had took piano lessons in here. But they couldn't play in here, just regular play. <laughs> and they couldn't play next door over here in the green room or in the blue room or in the east room. East room, biggest one in the whole house. Our whole house in Springfield was sitting fit inside the East Room of the White House, and our boys were told, no playing in these rooms. These are for official government use only. But they could go upstairs. Now, that's got more possibilities. Go up that grand staircase, and they come into my office. I had my office up there. They could come in here whenever they wanted. Even if I was in the middle of a big meeting, I didn't mind. Some people didn't like that, but I'm still their father after all. And the second floor here is where they had the bedrooms, too. Do you realize the White House has seven bedrooms? Seven, imagine that. As one for me, one for Mary, connected of course, one for Robert when he's home from college, one for Willie and Ted, one for my secretaries, Mr. Hay and Mr. Nicolay. And that still leaves two extra bedrooms. So next time you're in town here, you stop by and see us, all right? And then there's a little sitting area outside there, a kind of a, a library or, or living room, and, and there's some books there. And I can sit with my boys and, and read stories to my boys. I wanted my boys to learn to love to read as much as I love to read. And when we get tired of reading, we'd always just get on the floor and wrestle. My boys love wrestling. I should show you which was their bedroom. Their bedroom was this one right on the corner. Well, that's a nice room to have, isn't it? You can look out two different ways from there. After they got done with the second floor, they discovered there's also an attic in the White House. An attic's a fun place to play, isn't it? And then they discovered, well, there's a trap door in the attic, the ceiling. They went through that trap door, found themselves on the roof of the White House, turned it into a circus ground, into the deck of a boat, into a fort. The White House carpenter helped them build a fort up there. Imagine that. But of course, oh, one of the things, of course, we had, we had pets, didn't we? A lot of pets. Now, uh, what do we have in the White House? We had a little, little white dog named Jip, and we had a couple cats, Tabby and Dixie were the cats' names, you see. And, uh, and goats, my boys had goats for pets. Imagine that. Goats are a lot of trouble, aren't they? Both inside and outside. The gardener didn't like the goats. 
the, the servants inside didn't like the goats, but I said, oh, you let them be. They make my boys happy. And then one year a family gave us a turkey. A turkey is not a pet, is it? A turkey is for Christmas dinner. But Tad, he made the turkey his pet. He named him Jack. Jack followed Tad all around the White House grounds. A couple of days before Christmas, Tad came to me all upset. He said, Pa, Pa, don't let him kill Jack. He's a good turkey, he is. Well, I'm a kind-hearted father, aren't I? And I also have the power to grant pardons. I wrote out a pardon for Jack the turkey so he could live out his days in peace. Jack the Christmas turkey. But of course, it wasn't all fun and games, was it? Because of the terrible times we lived through. Civil War, four long years, four terrible years. Over 600,000 soldiers dead from battle wounds, disease, starvation, families divided. Families where one brother went to this side to fight, another brother went to that side to fight. Brothers fighting on opposite sides of a civil war. That's how terrible a civil war can be. After four long years, it appeared to start, start come to an end. I was reelected president, in fact, <laughs> which means got to give another speech. <laughs> now, by March 1865, it's pretty clear this war is almost over. The North is going to be victorious. The Union will be preserved. The slaves will be freed. I suppose the people were expecting a, a victory speech. But I said, no, I think uh, people need to hear something different. <laughs> both North and South. Well, of course, gave it over the Capitol, which by this time was finished, got the new dome on it. The Civil War is a punishment by God on this nation, both North and South, for the offense of slavery. Why would I say that? Well, I knew even as a boy growing up in Kentucky, a slave state, that I wouldn't want to be a slave. So I determined in my own heart never to make another person be my slave. That goes against all something we read in the scriptures. Well, Jesus was asked once, what's the greatest commandment of all, the most important commandment? He said, well, it's to love God. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy might. And then he said, there's a second one that's like it. Who else are we to love? Love thy neighbor as thyself. Treat other people the same way we ourselves would wish to be treated. If I would not be a slave, I ought not be a master. But that's the rule that we have violated as a nation, that golden rule. Here we were this wonderful nation dedicated to liberty and equality. And we had allowed an entire race of human beings to be made slaves, something we never would have wished for ourselves. So in my mind, the Civil War was our punishment allowed by God. Well, another month passed, came to April. Things are really looking up in April. Looks like it's about over now. April 9th, Palm Sunday, General Lee surrendered to General Grant. It's almost over now. I should say a word about General Grant. We went through so many generals out east, didn't we? Started out with McDowell and came Bull Run. What a disaster. Then we went with McClellan. Everyone thought McClellan's the man. McClellan thought he was the man. I can do it all, he said. Well, we found out otherwise especially after issuing my Emancipation Proclamation. I knew he would done fighting after that. He was totally against that. He had told me so. So then we turned to Burnside. And Burnside did all right, but then Fredericksburg wasn't so great. And then we turned to uh, Hooker, fighting Joe Hooker. I thought he might be the one. And Chancellorsville, another disaster. Then we turned to me, George Gordon Meade. And he got us that great victory there at Gettysburg. I said, this is it. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited. 10 days it took Lee to get across the Potomac. The river was swollen, the bridge was out. 10 days, and Meade let him go. I was so disappointed. I wrote out a long telegram to General Meade expressing my disappointment. I said, you have let a golden opportunity slip through your fingers. When will we ever get this chance again? And then I didn't send it. I figured what good will it do now? We still need him to fight after all. But uh, I don't think Meade's a man to finish this job. I said, I think there's only one man to finish this job. I had never met him before, but I heard all about him. My fighting general, I called him, General U.S. Grant, unconditional surrender, Grant. We brought him out to Washington. We got to meet the man. We made him lieutenant general, four stars, put him over the whole army. He could coordinate things. We needed that. He also understood some things. 
he understood the objective of the war was not to capture Richmond or any other place. The objective was to go find General Lee in the field and defeat him in the field. Until that done, the war was never over. He didn't keep coming back to me, asking for more men, more time, more supplies. He took what I gave him, did the best he could with it. It wasn't always pretty, but he got the job done. I'm very thankful to General Grant for that. Over there, General Grant. Well, as I said, April 9th, Lee surrenders to Grant. Two days later, I gave a speech right over there at the White House on the lawn there, whole lawn full of people, told them what we do in the war zone, how we bring the nation back together again, heal the wounds of the nation. I wanted a lenient policy toward the South, a generous policy. As I said at the end of my second inaugural address, with malice toward none, with charity for all. I believe that's the way forward. I said one other thing in that speech, I'm kind of on a side, I, I mentioned the black man and the right to vote. I, I said, look here, we've had black soldiers risking their lives in this war the last couple of years. I believe they've earned the right to vote. I didn't say more about it. I know a lot of people listening that day really weren't interested in hearing that. In fact, there's a fellow in the very back there. Well, you probably wouldn't know him. Uh, Booth was his name. Uh, John Wilkes Booth. Don't think he liked hearing that. Three days later was Good Friday, April 14th. Beautiful day here in Washington. Mary and I took a carriage ride that afternoon, talked about what we do when the war is over. Well, when I'm done being president, we'll travel. We'll go to California. We'll go to Europe, go to the Holy Land. And that evening, kind of to celebrate, I suppose, we went out to the theater. Is that Grover's? Ford's, I believe it was. Ford's Theater to see our American cousin. And there we were in the presidential box up there watching the show down below. About two thirds of the way through, there's one man on the stage all by himself, gives about the funniest line in the whole play. People laugh uproariously. They make enough noise, I suppose, to cover up the sound even of a, well, a pistol shot, for example. And that just happens to be my last memory. So whatever happened after that, you'll have to read about yourselves, I suppose. I'm guessing you can get a book about that at your library there. Well, just a couple of things to wrap up. I mentioned the Emancipation Proclamation. That was very important. But you know, that was a war measure. That means when the war is over, maybe the next president comes along and says that doesn't apply anymore. You people who used to be slaves have to be slaves again. It'd be like today what you call an executive order. I know you can't imagine a situation where one president issues orders, next one comes in behind and just undoes them, but it could happen, right? So we need to permanently change our laws regarding slavery. And the only way to do that is a constitutional amendment. That's why it was so important that on January 31st, the US House of Representatives passed the 13th Amendment. Now it's out to the states to be ratified. Three quarters of the states, that's all we need. Some people said that'll be three quarters of the loyal states. I said, no, I think we better get three quarters of all the states. They said, that'll mean some of the former Confederate states. I said, yes, gonna take longer, but it'll be more legitimate in the end. And we don't need hard feelings in the South now, do we? Well, I began by reading to you from my Gettysburg Address, but we didn't finish. So to conclude, I shall finish reading this to you. Remember, it's right up there if you wanna read it along. By the way, my second inaugural is right on the other wall there. I did the beginning part four score and seven years ago, liberty and equality, looking to the past. I did the middle part, what we were doing that day to dedicate a cemetery to the soldiers who died there. The last part looks to the future. Where do we go from here? What's left for us to do? Let's see, I read the line about the world will little note, no long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. A new birth of freedom. That was my hope. Just as we as a nation had a birth of freedom in 1776, now out of something so terrible as a civil war, we might have a new birth of freedom. But now give that freedom to more people, specifically to those who had been enslaved. Well, I thank you so much for your attention this past hour. It's been a wonderful audience. Now is your opportunity to ask me some questions. Now, I can only answer questions up to my own, uh, during my time period. Uh, 
up to that moment in the theater, can't go past that really. <laughs> but you can ask a question by using the telegraphic chat feature. You don't even need to use the dots and the dashes. You just type the letters right in there. Or if you want, you can unmute yourself and you could ask the question out loud. So I'm not sure if uh, Okaria has anything else to say to us about that Oh. I'm right here. So I'll, um, if you'd like, I can read the questions from the chat to you if you'd like. Oh, yeah, well, um, I, I can look in the chat. I thought, uh, go ahead. I don't see any questions yet. I just see no. some comments. Okay. Oh, yes. Rebecca is still there. That's good. Okay. So uh, questions from anybody. Uh, Rebecca can ask a question. Uh, adults can ask questions. <laughs> Your dog can ask a question if you really want to. <laughs> While we wait, I just want to thank you so much, Mr. Lincoln, because that was a wonderful presentation, really educational. I learned a lot of facts that I didn't know before, and you really get to learn about President Lincoln's life. So it, this was really a really informative, wonderfully done program. Well, thank you. I enjoy doing it. So good to remember our nation's history, right? Absolutely. Okay, we'll see some more people who enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah. And the way that you walked us through the virtual backgrounds was really fun. Well, you know, even an old old gentleman like me, 212, I can still learn new things. <laughs> it took me took me a little while, but uh, but I figured it out. <laughs> yeah, I, I had my uh, I had a, a 10 year old show me how to do it. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll just comment. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned a couple of things about New York, but New York was a very important state, and back in the day, a state with the largest population most electoral votes and of course my, my secretary of state William Seward is from the great state of New York. So um, I'm very appreciative of New York. Now New York City I had a little trouble with I'm sorry to say <laughs> you know during the war a lot of Democrats there. The mayor Fernando Wood he, he kind of gave me some trouble sometimes and, and those draft riots what was that all about now? <laughs> you know we had to call the army we had to call the army and to put out down the riots in New York City in the middle of the war. I really didn't need that unnecessary um, well anyway. <laughs> but uh, but overall, overall, you were very supportive. I appreciate that. And you did vote for me. That's good. <laughs> yeah, because without those 35 electoral votes, uh, I would not have been able to win. And the election would have been thrown to the House of Representatives. And who knows what would have happened then? Very true. Very true. All right. Well, there must be a question out there. Can't believe I answered all the questions during the program. We must just be shy out there. Anyone want to ask? Oh, there, how about there's Mary? Hello, Mary. Oh, you're on mute, Mary. You need to. Oh, hold on a sec. Yourself. Let me make sure they can mute themselves. I'm so sorry, guys. Go ahead. If anyone would like to unmute themselves, go oh, ahead. Oh, you hadn't said that. Okay. I had that. Yeah, okay. I got. I think I got unmuted. Uh, you look very well. For what did you say? Two hundred and what? Two hundred and twelve. Two twelve. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of horror. <laughs> Did you have a question for me? No, not really. I just wanted to say that. Okay. Just wanted to very, compliment very you. Interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I was two two hundred and twelve on two twelve February twelfth. Uh -huh. um, that, that only happens once in your lifetime, doesn't it? Or or after your lifetime? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, here's a question. <laughs> it gives me hope. <laughs> yes. I I'm 86. So. Oh, 86. That's four score and six. <laughs> Next year, yeah. you'll be four score and seven. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, there's a question here. How does it feel to be put on Mount Rushmore? Well, I, I'm not sure what Mount Rushmore is. Um, but if it's, if it's some sort of honor, well, I'm very honored. This is, this is an honor. I didn't know we would put this up here in Washington. It's very nice. And I do like to be able to sit down. A uh, man gets tired after a while standing all the time. <laughs> and it's a nice view. Have you ever seen the view from here? You look out straight ahead and you got the Washington Monument straight ahead. And beyond that is the Capitol. And there's a call called the mall there. And sometimes a lot of people fill up that mall. Crowds and crowds of people. And if I kind of look off that direction, I kind of see the one for Jefferson too. So, and there's some other ones spread around too. I'm still kind of learning them. <laughs> Do you have snow? Is there snow in Washington? Well, it, it, there was some snow down here in Washington, more than we normally get here in Washington. It doesn't normally snow much here, but yes. Yeah, hey, there's pretty much snow everywhere I hear. Even down in, in Texas, they say there's snow. Not here, not where I am. Oh, where are you at? Florida. 
Oh, you are in Florida. Oh, my. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us from Florida. That sunny Isles, which is not too sunny. It's cloudy today. <laughs> Okay. That's okay. wonderful. Here, Is I'm that... just going to stop the recording here. Oh, okay.